support the utilization of data when assessing marine casualties. Uh, I am Josh Standwick, Chief Executive of Maritime London, and I will be moderating today's session. Uh, we've put a great panel together today, uh, as we always do, to explore this rather pertinent subject. Uh, we've got Richard Meikle, Partner and Master Mariner, Mariner at Solis Marine Consultants. Richard will be presenting today with a number of interactive slides and videos, technology willing, uh, that will demonstrate how technology can enhance and hasten the casualty investigation process. Uh, we've got Duncan Campbell, uh, AIS and VDR analyst, also at Solis Marine. Uh, Duncan will be joining us for the panel discussion, providing us with some uh, much needed technical expertise when it comes to AIS and VDR. Uh, then we've got Tim Howes, Vice President at Guard UK. Uh, Tim, who is also uh, an Admiralty lawyer, will discuss how the clubs are using data to deliver value to members, but also some of the practical difficulties that can occur when interpreting, interpreting complex data in the assessment of a casualty. Uh, I should also add that Tim is a, a fellow trustee with me of the Maritime London Officer Cadetship Programme uh, and was also in its, uh, in its first cadre of, of cadets. So, Tim has a, a long and proud association with, with Maritime London, and it's great to have him here today. Uh, and then joining us from Hong Kong, uh, and apologies for sort of disturbing your dinner time, we've got Ron Clark, uh, Admiralty Manager at Reed Smith. Uh, and Ron will be exploring how, how reconstructions can be deployed in the courtroom or, or arbitration hearing. Uh, we will then move on, on to a, a panel discussion, followed by a live Q&A. Uh, before we get started, I will provide a, a quick run through of the obligatory housekeeping notices. Uh, whilst we don't expect any tech issues, if we if we do experience any te technical difficulties, please bear with us. Uh, we'll do our best to minimise background noise, but I will apologise in advance for any pet, children, telephone related interruptions. And lastly, but importantly, as I mentioned, there will be the opportunity to ask questions in the text box. We will answer as many questions as we can, uh, but we will only do so uh, at the very end of the webinar. Uh, we have uh, a lot to cover today, so this is probably enough from me for now. So I will now pass the baton over to, to Tim Howes. Uh, Tim, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, Joss, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thanks for the kind introduction as well. Uh, so my background is um, uh, as a mariner um, and as a, a maritime lawyer. Uh, <clears throat> and um, with Guard, I'm responsible for uh, managing Guard's relationships with industry bodies uh, with a focus on the uh, international group of P&I clubs and marine insurers. So I think, as uh, probably most of you know, Guard is um, a large and diversified P&I insurer. Uh, we offer products to ship owners, uh, the energy sector, shipbuilding, uh, offshore charterers and traders, and small uh, craft. Uh, so, for, but for ship owners, it's it's the traditional uh, P&I uh, liability insurance and and obviously hull and machinery, which includes um, increased value risks. Um, a little bit about the the, the sort of scale and diversity. Um, uh, we're as a P&I insurer, we're around uh, just under 20% of the uh, the market share for the international uh, group of P&I clubs, which itself is um, around 90 to 95% of uh, commercial shipping. Um, on the marine side, we're about uh, we insure about 13,000 vessels or just over, and we have claims lead on about 40% um, of those. Uh, premiums uh, around or just under 900 million per year last year. And we deal with 15 to 20,000 claims per year. So we have we have quite a, a, a big volume um, in, in terms of uh, what, what we're talking about uh, during this webinar today. We've got um, over 200 claims staff to, to respond to those claims, uh, lawyers, mariners, pilots, harbour masters, rig masters, engineers, scientists, biologists, economists, and average adjusters. Um, and in terms of claims, we, we're just under 600 million a year we spend. And, and obviously a significant proportion of that is spent on uh, external advice, external service providers, um, which obviously has a lot of relevance to what we're here to talk about today. 
In terms of what we aim for uh, as an organization uh, and what we aim to provide uh, to our clients and members, we're looking for professional uh, solution orientated uh, and proactive advice. Um, it's sort of a, a hassle free and pragmatic approach. Um, we look uh, first and foremost to, to minimize disruptions uh, to the operations of our clients and members. We're looking at maintaining and protecting their image and their reputation uh, and clearly minimizing the, the financial consequences of claims. Uh, so that's also relevant to, to what we're talking about today. Um, across all our, our business lines, over half the claims involve uh, what we would on this webinar call uh, casualties. So that's groundings, um, structural failures, contact damage, collisions, fire uh, and explosion incidents. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that all of those types of incidents can benefit from uh, desktop solutions based on uh, the, the available data, uh, at least initially. And of course, uh, more specifically on the, the collision scenarios as liability for uh, traditional RDC and FFO risks is, is, is invariably with P&I or Hull insurers. Uh, and as we do both of those, uh, this is very much bread and butter uh, work for us. So uh, data and desktop analysis, reconstructions, um, it, it, it's, it's very much of interest and it's very relevant to what we do as an organization and what our members need. Um, I would see it and Gars sees it as a, a prompt and ready uh, source of information and it gives you a very good oversight of a situation um, rapidly and that can be hugely important. Um, it obviously has a lot of benefits uh, some of them include the fact that it can it can assist with early settlement, which is every, in everybody's interest. Um, it can help point us to the likely outcome. So in a sort of blunt instrument way, whether we're on the side of the angels or whether we're likely to sort of crash and burn on liability. And that can then help us to set an objective. Perhaps the objective will be to settle early and get out or the objective might be to to fight this one. And we can then set our strategy based on that objective. So it gives us that early indication. Uh, pointing us in the right direction. And of course, it helps us uh, from a commercial perspective, um, setting reserves um, and um, giving notifications to the market, which is relevant for both PNI and Marine. I think uh, it, it, most importantly, on a practical level, it, it gives us um, the ability to identify uh, the resources that we're going to need and where we should focus our investigations. Um, and that will mean that we have a more efficient uh, claims handling process. Um, as, as I think we're going to go on to discuss, um, it, it, it's, doing reconstructions can often be quicker than the traditional investigation involving um, uh, traveling to the site of the casualty and then taking written, written statements. Uh, so it has an advantage in that sense, um, but it's not without issues on its own. Um, for example, complex data uh, can uh, produce uh, disputes of its own. Uh, there can be arguments about the provenance of the data and uh, maintaining the custodial chain. Um, and obviously the different uh, interpretations of that data can be crucial. So you, you can end up in a situation where you have almost a dispute within a dispute where the, the, the data and the interpretation of it can be so crucial to liability and the final resolution of the claim that, uh, that you can almost lose sight of the, the broader issue. So it's, I think it's necessary to keep things in perspective and not be overwhelmed by data. Um, so we see it as um, one of many tools which uh, assists with the handling of claims. It's valuable, no doubt. Um, we would very much encourage the development of it. Um, we see it as innovative and an area where we would like to see development and enhancement um, and, and in the sort of much broader sense, uh, it, it does have relevance to our, our core value, which is looking at sustainable maritime development. Um, it can play an important role in uh, promoting safety um, and in loss prevention. So we see it as, as more relevant, not, not, not just to claims, but to the broader sort of uh, good and nourishment of the industry and, and making sure that accidents and, and casualties and incidents are minimized in the future. So it's absolutely relevant uh, on a daily basis to an insurer like Guard, uh, and I look forward to to discussing a little bit more about it. But I'll pass it back to you now, uh, Joss. 
Tim, thank you for that. I mean, uh, from from my perspective as an organisation which which represents professional services in the London market, I'm pleased to see that you know your your view is that you know technology uh, and reconstructions will very comp will, will very much complement the existing processes rather than uh, replace the existing processes, and the, you know the human element, if you like, will will remain as important as ever. Uh, Tim, you know, you mentioned uh, how data can, uh, you know, create disputes of its own within the within the claims process, uh, and that seems like a, a fitting um, a fitting point to pass over to, to Ron Clark from Reed Smith, who will be discussing, you know, how how that data and how these reconstructions can be effectively deployed within the within the courtroom or arbitration hearing. So, uh, Ron, I'll um, I'll now pass over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Joss. Um, just by way of introduction, um, I'm a qualified master mariner, having served at sea for 17 years on a wide range of uh, cargo and passenger ships. I'm, I, I joined my first uh, law firm back in 1993, so I have accumulated more than 25 years experience of investigating shipping casualties and advising owners and insurers on such matters. Over that time, the investigative tools available to the lawyers has developed, and none more so than the availability of electronic data in recent years, uh, which uh, Richard will talk about shortly. So in that context, I'd just like to pick up on a, uh, one of Tim's comments about how such data assists with early settlement of cases, because I think this is uh, an area um, where the availability of data comes into its own. To demonstrate uh, just how far we've come, um, when I first started in this job, um, it meant that I boarded a plane to attend a casualty without a laptop or even a mobile phone. Armed with my notebook and a camera, I'd collect what evidence I could by interviewing what witnesses I could find, and the case would be advanced based almost entirely on witness statements, uh, which invariably differed from the other ship's witness statements to such an extent you were often left wondering if the opposing lawyers were dealing with the same collision. If we were lucky and the ships had struck each other at a broad enough angle to make a speed and angle of blow analysis using Minorsky's method reasonably reliable, another strand of evidence could be used in an effort to determine what happened. Very occasionally, a vessel was fitted with a course recorder. And on some of those occasions, the course recorder was actually switched on at a time of the collision, adding to the evidential trail. Otherwise, it was left to the court to determine which of the witness accounts was most reliable, often some five years or more after the event. Now, the availability of independent electronic data without doubt brings more clarity and certainty to the consideration of evidence as a whole. So that in many cases, there will be little factual dispute between the parties concerning the navigation of vessels leading to a collision. That's not to say that witness evidence is now redundant, but the availability of independent, cogent, contemporaneous evidence provided by the data means that a near complete picture can be formed very quickly after a casualty. The English Admiralty Court embraces such availability of data and in recent years has introduced changes to the civil procedure rules and practice directions, imposing an obligation on the parties in a collision case to disclose and inspect such data well in advance of the normal disclosure process so that scope for negotiated settlement at an early stage is facilitated, avoiding the time and cost exposure of a long drawn out dispute. I'd also like to briefly develop um, another point made by Tim, which, um, which is that the available data may still be open to different interpretation and may mean that early settlement of a case may still prove elusive. The recent example of the reported case from the English uh, Admiralty Court is the collision between Alexandria I and the Ever Smart in the approaches to Jebel Ali. In that case, the respective experts advising the parties had a wealth of data available to them. So much so that not only were they able to agree a plot showing the navigation of both vessels leading to the collision, they were able to produce videos providing a bird's eye view of the collision, albeit their particular value was somewhat dismissed by Mr. Justice Tier, 
who described the videos as merely interesting, but adding no more information regarding the navigation of the vessels than was apparent from the agreed track and schedule of navigation. Now the case went all the way to the Admiralty Court and even to the Court of Appeal. The main issue between the parties was interpretation of whether the narrow channel or crossing rule applied, but there was also disputed accounts of how the voyage data recorder was interpreted. For example, seconds before the vessels collided, the VDR recorded the master of Eversmart saying, what's that? Two minutes after the collision, the master was heard questioning himself. How come you didn't see it? This was relied upon by counsel for Alexandra One as evidencing the master of Eversmart not having seen Alexandra One at all. This was disputed by Eversmart's counsel on the basis of an explanation given by the master in a statement that had, alas, not been signed by the master over a dispute about his pension. It was therefore left to the court to weigh the evidence before determining that the master probably had seen Alexandra One, but what he hadn't appreciated, or indeed seen, was just how far across the narrow channel Alexandra One had advanced. So that's one example of how witness evidence contained within a signed statement still has a place in the determination of liability for a collision. Just going to hand back now to Joss. Thanks very much. Ron, uh, uh, thank you so much for that. And that, that fascinating case study, which I must admit, uh, much to my detriment, I'm sure I was I was unaware of. Um, I, I'd now like to sort of uh, pass over to, to Richard from, from Solis. Uh, as I say, Richard has got a presentation for us where he will uh, showcase uh, how uh, a virtual reconstruction can work. Uh, now, we have tried this before and it's all worked without a hitch and it's, it's all incredibly impressive. Richard, I hope you've sorted out the, the sound because that klaxon really did, uh, you know, leave a ringing in my ears the first time round. But I'm sure that's all all sorted out now. Uh, and without any further ado, I will pass pass over to Richard, who, who really does have an excellent presentation for us today. Thanks very much, Joss. I can assure you the, there's no need to uh, uh, wait for the klaxons. They, they've all been removed and uh, I'll uh, certainly point out the point where the, the, the whistles are blown and the master is shouting later on. So so thanks, Joss. Uh, and now sort of uh, my presentation, we're moving into the data and the use of data in, uh, in reconstructions and the benefits uh, that they can provide uh, and also highlighting some of the areas uh, where, um, where perhaps uh, judgment is needed. So uh, Solis Marine uh, is, uh, operates out of the UK in Singapore uh, and uh, offices in Shanghai with two other offices in China. Uh, we also have a, an office in uh, Rotterdam where we operate our fire and chemical consultancy, uh, as well as a presence in South Africa and uh, with uh, Solis Marine Engineering in Falmouth, who also provide a range of engineering services to the uh, offshore renewables and gas uh, industry. All of our uh, senior consultants have given evidence in court or arbitration, uh, and we have three SCRs uh, on the panel at Lloyd's. All of our work, obviously, is uh, supported by uh, data and the data that we gather uh, and is presented on our uh, rapid replay uh, platform. So going into the data, the electronic uh, navigation data, the aims of, the, of today is really to show the benefits of, uh, of reconstructions, providing a prompt overview of an event leading uh, up to an incident, uh, and the ability that data has in providing that clear, impartial, uh, data-based analysis for, for investigation to, to, to assist and uh, as uh, Ron mentioned where uh, earlier on where uh, perhaps witness statements don't agree we uh, would like to hope that uh, data can be there to assist. So just briefly and I'm not going to go into the, the technical uh, matters of, uh, of, of data recovery and uh, Duncan is available later on uh, for anybody who has pressing technical questions on, on data. Uh, but I'm just going to run through here some of the areas, some of the areas uh, where we get our, 
data from for use in the reconstruction. And AAS is obviously the most uh, frequently used uh, and has the benefit of always being uh, publicly available, accessible, uh, and uh, provides the same information to all. Um, originally designed for collision avoidance, it's, it's just given us that so much more information and uh, that we can use, which is uh, obviously uh, we can record both terrestrially and is recorded from, from satellite much uh, more and more. Voyage data recorder uh, is the other ubiquitous and most frequent use of, of, of data, uh, the black box on board the ship, uh, which does give uh, more frequent uh, data than perhaps AIS does, but it does have the disadvantage that it's only available to the to the master and to the technician and to the, the whoever holds the data uh, for their vessel. I'll talk a little bit more about AIS and, and DDR in a second, but it's also always worth considering where other data might be available to assist in, uh, in reconstructions and other areas that perhaps I don't immediately come to mind. Uh, the ECTIS, uh, which is now obviously on almost every vessel and provides a great greater frequency of data and accuracy of data um, and also provides the AIS data for other vessels in the area. So a lot of information and also has the benefits over the VDR, the, 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 the time that the data is stored in an ECDIS may well exceed significantly that uh, of the VDR. Data will also be available from, from VTS um, and the, you may get the AIS or CCTV and other radar information from VTS, um, who would also uh, have access to pilotage uh, units, uh, which the, the pilot who may have gathered uh, from his own independent unit, providing yet yeah, another source of independent data. And uh, berthing assistance systems, again, provide very accurate uh, and very frequent information, which is particularly useful in berthing incidents. So uh, a little bit more about AIS. Um, again, originally uh, designed for data to provide, to give, provide data and assistance to other vessels for collision avoidance. Uh, perhaps it's a, an unintended consequence of, of AIS that it's provided the industry with a, a huge amount of data uh, to monitor vessels uh, at sea, uh, both for collision, uh, for investigation and for analysis um, and many other and many other areas. So the AIS data, uh, which is provided, uh, and then sent down NMES sentences, uh, can then be used uh, by us in our rapid replay platform to uh, provide reconstructions from the data that it provides. Again, benefits of AIS very much that uh, it's publicly available uh, and accessible, and uh, therefore. Um, provides access to that information. One of the things about AIS, which is a limiting factor, is the frequency uh, of the uh, reporting intervals. Uh, particularly when you see a reconstruction, and I'll show one in a second, uh, you'll see that um, uh, the frequency that a vessel at anchor may only transmit its AIS uh, every three minutes, whereas a, a vessel steaming along at 23 knots uh, and changing course uh, will transmit us uh, an AIS signal every two seconds. So it's one area uh, to be considered of when uh, looking at uh, the data that you get from AIS. What does uh, VDR record? Again, VDR data, uh, the benefits of the VDR are uh, that we get a, radio, a radar picture, um, recorded so we can see the radar images that would be provided on board at the time. Uh, we get the NMEA data, which gives significantly more uh, information than you would get from AIS, including uh, rudder angle and heading. Uh, you also get the depth from the echo sounder. The AIS, as I mentioned, from the, your own vessel, plus uh, the AIS from all other, perhaps from other vessels in, in the area. Uh, as well as engine data, alarms, um, and on some vessels, also the watertight integrity, etc., and fire alarm data uh, as well. So a lot more information there. And also, crucially, uh, again, I think as Ron mentioned in his uh, comments earlier, you get audio. And the audio is, uh, is very beneficial 
uh, and, but also when overlaid with a reconstruction is very assistance. But we all know that uh, getting good quality uh, audio out of a VDR is, uh, is a bit of a lottery uh, in as much that sometimes it's fantastic uh, and sometimes it's entirely inaudible. And now also looking at data much more frequently, we are uh, getting data uh, transmitted ashore. This used to be the preserve of uh, large cruise companies and, and other sort of more wealthy organizations, but now more frequently, uh, we're just getting, we're getting data transferred instantly or ashore uh, rather than having to wait. So that information uh, that would be held on the VDR uh, is now or maybe immediately available from companies. And that's becoming a, uh, a more and more frequent uh, event. And I think in the future, particularly as I'll come on to mass later on, uh, it's, a, it's certainly an area where that data immediately available, uh, both for monitoring, but also for investigating accidents and incidents almost immediately after they've happened. So I'd like to uh, show you a reconstruction uh, that we, from our own uh, rapid replay system, uh, which shows uh, two, two vessels. This is a made up uh, or a scenario, but it shows very well uh, the benefits of, uh, of reconstruction. Uh, the information for vessel here and the information for vessel A, uh, as you'll see over there. So the interesting thing is here, while you see both vessels, You'll also see that this highlights when the information is actually a transmitted information point, which is also when the vessel turns red and when that uh, information is interpolated. And that interpolation time is something I'm sure which will come up uh, in discussion later because uh, uh, that affects the, the frequency and, and how much of that data is actually transmitted and actually the gap between it isn't quite important. Uh, benefits of this system is also it can be paused. Uh, that one was played at 32 times the speed, uh, but you can also stop it uh, and analyze the positions of the two vessels, the distances at, at any point between them. Another use of, uh, of, of data, and this is a prime example of where VDR and the frequency of VDR data can be used. This was a reef damage case uh, uh, a number of years ago, where there was a very large uh, claim on a, a reef damage of more than a million square meters. Uh, and by using data and by plotting the vessel uh, from the information provided, we were able to uh, show that the actual area that was damaged by the reef was a fraction uh, of that which was, uh, was originally claimed. And therefore, the, the value of the claim could be uh, significantly reduced. Also, uh, use of data, this was in uh, an unsafe port claim uh, where uh, a vessel, large vessel, uh, Cape size bulk carrier was turning in a basin uh, and made contact. Um, and there was a claim for unfair port. But by going back through the data for numerous vessels that had carried out the same maneuver, uh, it was clear to see that this uh, maneuver had been carried out uh, successfully. Uh, almost 50 times before. Uh, and again, that comparison of one vessel uh, with the other vessels that have used the same area is, is, is something which is uh, becoming more and more frequent when uh, analyzing uh, incidents. So from that uh, data, uh, and again, the, from the rapid replay presentation, we can also uh, use that data further. We can dig into it, analyze it um, in whatever way uh, most benefits the analysis of that incident. Uh, and that would, uh, for example, be trying to show what lights would be showing, whether we're looking at uh, the headlights, the uh, red and green side lights of a vessel, and at what times uh, those lights would have become apparent. Again, going back to the basics of seamanship and showing the seamanship aspects, but by using uh, data to, to make the point. Also with data, it's in this case for a breach of sanctions, it's not the match the use of data, but the absence of data, uh, which uh, is, uh, is helpful. Uh, and therefore by following vessels, which may be accused of breaching sanctions, we can show uh, vessels when they stop transmitting. And we can also see that other vessels in the area 
and that perhaps the vessel should have been uh, continued to transmit their AIS data. Um, and obviously those gaps uh, become, become relevant and can be analyzed and show uh, whether the vessel should have been there or shouldn't have been there. And also, as well as AIS, we can also look at uh, other means of data and satellite data that may be available from LRIT uh, and other areas and other data that may have not been considered when, even if the AIS was turned off, uh, that the vessel was actually still transmitting uh, data in another form, which all adds into uh, making sure you look for all the sources of data that might be available. We can then take those uh, that data and present uh, 3D uh, reconstructions, uh, which are useful, uh, but as Ron pointed out, uh, may or may not benefit a case, but certainly the ability now to create 3D re reconstructions and also, uh, for instance, now uh, to use 3D modeling and to use uh, point cloud uh, analysis of particular vessels to show the actual form of a vessel and use that uh, and then build up reconstructions using, uh, using data to build up three constructions. Certainly builds an early picture of what happened uh, but again, its use uh, in court and arbitration is something which is still being discussed, and I'm sure something we'll discuss later on uh, once we have our Q&A and our discussions later. So now I'd just like to do a, a case study uh, of where evidence uh, was used um, to show uh, an accident and how data can be used to, uh, to, to both enhance and to show uh, the actual events that led up. So this is uh, a, a video of a collision between an anchor handler and a tanker, and perhaps one you can uh, play along with at home. Uh, so the video that was the evidence that was provided uh, shows the collision, and this is the one that uh, Josh was referring to with the bells and whistles. Hopefully there's no bells and whistles, but uh, uh, just to... Um, Clarify the the background sign to this was the uh, was the master of the uh, the tanker shouting and screaming and saying what are you doing uh, and leaning on the whistle uh, to attract the anchor handler's uh, attention. So perhaps from the video uh, showing the anchor handler uh, here on the port side with the tanker with apparently on a on a steady heading there with we could look at it and say actually provided the evidence we've got from this video. Uh, what percentage of liability would you place on the tanker and what uh, liability would you, uh, with a thumb in the air, uh, provide from the anchor handler? So that was um, the evidence that was provided and the, sh and the captain shouting, um, uh, which was then presented and there was a claim made by the, by the tanker. So from that, uh, the AIS data was gathered and we were able to create a rapid re replay reconstruction of the event. And this is um, what the rapid replay construction looked like. Uh, over here, we've got vessel, vessel A, which is the tug. Uh, and over here, this is the, the, um, the, the, the tanker. So we have the vessels here at anchor, vessel A, which is the anchor handler, uh, at anchor and vessel B, the um, be the tanker. Again, the benefits of going and getting the data and running the data rather for the 30 seconds before the collision uh, and showing how the vessel was behaving for a significant time before also adds to the benefit of just seeing that short clip uh, of the video uh, and therefore only being shown, shown the, uh, the, the information that's needed rather than all the information. So a very different picture uh, is then uh, provided by the, uh, by, the, by the rapid replay reconstruction and then it gives a very different view as to what the liability between the two vessels uh, for that collision was. So, Again, only your, your view can change. Uh, and again, perceptions and what the eye sees and what the better statements give against the actual data. 
So we could take that uh, example and we could then take that back again, as Ron said, more appropriately for courts and arbitrations, and we can produce that as a 2D model uh, and a two-day um, of, the, of the tanker and of the anchor handler. And therefore, you can see the movement of the anchor handler compared to the, uh, the movement uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the tanker, giving a very different picture to the one that was originally presented. More and more, we're using the AIS data to provide us with, with other uh, bigger data, as, as, as a phrase that likes to be used. And uh, here is an example of following the uh, sinking of the Thorco cloud in the, in the Singapore Strait. Um, 12 hours worth of data was gathered from AIS to show the movements of the vessel and to see whether the traffic uh, monitoring and traffic uh, system that was put in place uh, was successful. So here is a, an example of what 12 hours of traffic looks like. Uh, and also looking specifically in this area here, to see whether that traffic management has been, been successful. Again, building up that picture, more data, more information, uh, and more ability to then make a judgment call as to whether the situation is being, that's being shown is the situation which is uh, in fact results. So uh, a very interesting and enlightening uh, reconstruction. Just again on data, Going forward to uh, autonomous surface ships, uh, very much the future and very much uh, surface ships are, uh, autonomous surface ships are here and they're operating. And the amount of data that we'll then be getting from surface ships will only increase, it will increase exponentially. Uh, because, you know, mass ships not only providing data, but completely uh, re um, reliant on data. Uh, and therefore, when we do start to have claims and start to have incidents with them, but, uh, autonomous surface ships, uh, that data will become uh, even more present. So an industry which is already established with a, a code of practice uh, and with uh, liability insurance in place already for autonomous vessels, uh, we only wait for those claims to come in. Uh, and in some cases, with an autonomous vessel, the only evidence we will have is the digital evidence. There won't be uh, very much else contemporary evidence apart from the, uh, the digital. The use of data was, uh, was considered when Solis uh, worked with the UK's uh, MCA, the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, on a project called Marlab. Uh, this was to develop a test site which was based in Portland. Uh, which you can see on the on the image there, uh, for a new online platform which allowed data sharing with other uh, mass organisations. Uh, all of this uh, helped develop the testing mass in UK waters. Uh, project used data collected from, amongst others, the uh, from AIS, uh, weather from the Met Office, and seabed information from the uh, UKHO. So that continual moving forward and Solis's involvement uh, with uh, data uh, always uh, will only increase in the future. Uh, and finally, just look again, other uses of data for statistical analysis and as a heat map, uh, more and more we're looking at comparing and contrasting the tracks of one vessel against another to show whether that vessel was um, uh, acting and maneuvering as it would be expected. So we can compare it with a number of vessels passing uh, the distances, and we can show heat maps of uh, traffic flow and traffic densities. So uh, lots there, uh, lots of useful data, um, and lots of points for discussion, I hope. So uh, back to you, Joss. Uh, Richard, thanks, uh, thanks so much for that. I mean, if I could now invite all of our panellists back onto the Back onto the screen, we'll move into our, our panel discussion, uh, covering some of the points that we've, uh, we've just gone through there. I'd like to thank all of the present presenters who did a fantastic job. And Richard, thank you again for that incredibly insightful presentation. Uh, just a quick note, and I see my colleague has put something up in the chat box, but to let everyone know, uh, this webinar is being recorded uh, and we'll send out uh, a recording of that, uh, send out the recording tomorrow. So do feel free to cascade that out to your contacts and those people who feel relevant, who you feel relevant, who weren't able to, 
to get on the call today. Um, Richard, uh, sort of to pick up from, from where you left off, really, uh, and particularly with, with one eye on autonomous vessels, et cetera, uh, you know, the, the process of responding to a casualty involves a number of stakeholders. Given the increased utilization of data, you know, what is the future of the, of the club correspondent, the surveyor, the, the expert witness, etc and I'll, I'll open that up sort of across the panel but but ron how about we, we start with you on that on that question sure thanks for that um well as lawyers um who will also be listed in that um the stakeholders there um I just say from a um, from a legal uh, perspective, I'll just limit uh, my views uh, to the issue of, uh, of privilege. Um, now, privilege is a huge topic, but for these limited purpose, purposes, uh, privilege entitles a party to withhold evidence from production to a third party or the court, at least up until the stage of legal proceedings where privilege uh, might be waived in respect of disclosable documents. For purposes of compliance with the civil procedure rules in England and, uh, and in Hong Kong, for that matter, electronic data falls into the category of a document. The danger with increased availability and utilization of data uh, is the risk of waiver of privilege. The term data is common, commonly misunderstood and with modern communications, it's all too easy uh, to share data around. And this can have, unfortunately for clients, consequences in that privilege can be lost uh, with limited exception uh, once lost privilege cannot be reasserted and so i think you know as a stakeholder from a lawyer's perspective and uh, you'll probably say uh, perhaps with some justification he would say that wouldn't he um, it's uh, critically important that uh, lawyers uh, be engaged uh, from an early stage so as to be able to control and manage privilege uh, litigation privilege is not necessarily dependent on there being a lawyer in the chain of correspondence, unlike solicitor and client privilege, but it certainly helps. Lawyers do tend to be best placed to advise on privilege, identifying privileged documents and ensuring that waiver does not occur inadvertently or otherwise, uh, and generally managing the data control process. Yeah, th uh, thanks for that, Ron. I mean Tim, I expect you have a, a similar perspective on things, but from from a club's view, as the sort of the hub of the action, very often where a casualty is involved. I mean, uh, as I say, what do you think? What, what's what's your view in terms of the future of the of the stakeholders within the market? Um, thanks, Joss. Uh, I think that they're still uh, completely relevant today, as they were in the past. Um, and I believe that that relevance will remain in the future. I think that um, the correspondent is still going to be necessary. We're still going to need to obtain data locally. It's not something that we can do at the moment or in the foreseeable future from, from headquarters, as it were, um, and that the surveyor to physically inspect the ship or to physically retrieve the data uh, will be relevant. And I think the expert to interpret that data is also going to be relevant. I think that the points that, that Ron makes are completely valid. And I think that the way that we do things and the way that the correspondent surveyor and the expert will do things will, will shift in focus to be more, more focused on data and more focused on the, the niceties of using data. Um, because what we don't want is a situation where all the data is put onto Dropbox and then the link <laughs> to the Dropbox is just shared. <laughs> <laughs> with everybody, because uh, that's precisely the sort of thing that Ron is talking about. So it's just a different way of doing things, but the, the fundamentals are the same. We get the information and then we assess the case based on that information. Uh, back to you, Joss. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tim. Now, uh, Duncan is, is perhaps the only person on this uh, uh, on this panel whose whose role might not be at risk if we if we follow the follow this course to perhaps its disputed natural conclusion. I mean, what's your view on this? I mean, you're, you're at the front end and you understand the capabilities of, of the data and how it may be able to be utilized in the future. 
I, I think it's, it's it's very much a piece of the puzzle. It's not the it's not the whole puzzle. The the data that you get off the vessels, uh, you still need surveyors to go on board uh, to to look at the damage because there's no way you can ex assess the extent of damage, say from uh, from the data we have available. So really, there is. It is, it is only a piece of the puzzle, a very helpful piece, obviously. Uh, but uh, and I think going on from the to the expert witness and analysis of it, of their interpretation of the of the of the data as well, because uh, the data is not going to tell you what good seamanship is. Uh, a, a master mariner with extensive experience is going to tell you that, and uh, that's really what we see it as. And we'll hand back to you as well, Joss. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for that, Duncan. I think, you know, just just to go back to the the presentation there, Richard. You know, as I say, you you did an excellent job of of showing how how useful uh, remote reconstructions can be when assessing a casualty. Uh, however, you know, we're we're all aware that there are a number of of different products on the market, and I think you know alignment when it comes to the use of data is not peculiar to this issue i think we're seeing it in a number of different areas within the maritime sector but is there is there a problem in general with with the lack of uniformity uh, in regards to how data is being deployed uh, and interpreted uh, and uh, richard how about we start with you on that one yeah i, I think there is and, and we've seen that um recently where uh, the same data is presented in a different way uh, and that time again between each data point and the how the data is interpolated is 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 different with each system, uh, and it's something that everyone needs to be conscious of, aware of, and particularly when looking at those AIS refresh rates, uh, something which is is relevant and will be questioned. So I think one of the benefits of, of our system, particularly, is that flashing red when you've got a data point, uh, and knowing when you're seeing data and when you're seeing interpolation. And clarity in that is is the most point. The worst thing I think to do is to have the data and have more of the workings unseen. As long as you, the more of your workings that you can be seen on the screen, and therefore the less interpretation that's needed of it. Uh, but it, it is interesting that the more systems you have, and also as they get cleverer, for want of a better word, um, that clarity and that logic that you're seeing uh, will will slightly get lost. So I think keeping it increasing the clarity of it, but keeping the simplicity of it is, 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 the, is the only way it will be, because the more complex they get, the more you'll have to break it down the time you get further down the road in, in our, into arbitration and court. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Th thanks, Richard. And, you know, Ron, from your perspective, as someone who has to, you know, interpret this data in the courtroom or, 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 or I mean, at least to inform your QC or, or in an arbitration hearing, I mean, you must see this problem in a sort of real time way, I suppose, in the fact that a number of people are using different platforms and, and how that data is interpreted and how that data can be disputed must, must or, or does it create issues for you when you are when you're putting your case together uh, thanks Josh. yes uh, uh, most certainly and um uh, just a couple of days ago i was reading um on a uh, reported case in uh, in the singapore high court which was a collision between the uh, the mount apo and the uh, hanjin uh, ras lafan um which brings a very, which you know, brought very much to light the point that Richard uh, mentions about the uh, refresh rate or the uh, the timestamps with AIS. Um, in that particular case in Singapore, um, plots were compiled by the respective experts using uh, AIS and the vessel's VDR data. And uh, these consisted of two-dimensional and three-dimensional animations, uh, similar to uh, as Richard was describing earlier, with the two-dimensional animation giving a kind of um, uh, overhead view, um, but the 3D animation was um, was giving uh, effectively the the um, the view from the uh, respective bridges of each ship um, involved in the collision. Uh, now, the preparation involved interpretation and processing of the data using software tools to uh, reconcile the data obtained from different sources. Uh, where, for example, the internal clocks of the systems generating 
and recording data um, may not be showing the same time. Um, that has to be reconciled, and the uh, which the experts did their best to reconcile um, uh, those. In the end, the judge preferred one particular expert's re uh, reconstruction than, than the other. But um, I just picked this bit out of the judgment, um, where it says that um, the judge described the process as expressions of the skill and judgment of the experts in their attempts to render a close approximation of what had occurred based on the way they pr process the available data subject to various margins of error. And, and the judge then issued a reminder that plots are, re uh, are reconstructions and are not actual aerial photographs or video footage, fo uh, video footage of the event. Um, I would just say as well though, that um, it's not to say that such 3D animations don't have a valuable uh, role to play uh, in the courtroom. Um, in 2012, we had one of the worst maritime disasters here in Hong Kong's history, uh, when the passenger vessels Lama 4 and Sea Smooth collided, resulting in the death of 39 passengers, um, including uh, a number of children. Now, both masters were charged with 39 counts of manslaughter, and we commissioned advanced animation of events in that particular place, uh, leading to the collision in our defense of the uh, master of uh, Lama 4. Now, that was because it was a jury trial made of members of the public with little or no maritime experience at all. In such a case, uh, animation proved to be crucial to be a crucial tool um, in our successful defense uh, of the master. So every case has to be considered on its own facts in terms of deploying data and the method of its uh, interpretation. So I just had a, a bit of a delay there. Uh, thanks for that, Ron. I think, you know, uh, one of the things we might do now is we've got some we've got some questions which are from coming through on the chat box, which are relatively pertinent to what we've just been discussing. Uh, you know, the, the first one, which is which is anonymous, uh, talks about, you know, and this is this is a, a well known debate, I suppose, you know, and that, that seafarers are are increasingly asked to uh, utilize and interpret uh, increasingly complex systems. Uh, and is there a is there a risk that uh, on the bridge seafarers are becoming over reliant on on computers? Uh, and therefore not employing the sort of core seafaring skills. Um, and, and what sort of risk is there in terms of in terms of casualties in the future, if that's a, if that is a trend uh, and whether it's a trend that is uh, increasing. So, um, you know, we've got three mariners on the call today. So maybe this is a good one to start with, to start with Tim, perhaps. Um, thanks, Joss. Yeah, I mean, it sort of links on to what um, Ron and Richard were talking about. I think if you if you focus the entire case on data, uh, uh, two things happen. You get a time and a cost component, an extension on time and extension on costs in resolving it, and you end up with a dispute within a dispute. But I think touching on um, that, that point from the chat is that if we assure and the courts assure are focusing entirely on data, then we're elevating data in terms of its status. And, and the, the seafarers, uh, sure, the seafarers at sea will see greater prominence in data and will focus more on the data that is available to them. And there is, of course, a risk that, that they, they then spend less time focusing on, on lookout by sight and by hearing. And we create more casualties uh, inadvertently because they're not looking out the window. So I think it's a, it's a case of balancing it and recognizing that data is a tool, but it is not the sort of the solution to all of our problems. Uh, that's my views on it, Joss. Back to you. Uh, Richard, Ron, do you have anything anything further to add to, to, Tim's, to Tim's point of view there? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think it, it, there's always a risk, risk. and I think this is a bit like the it is. Uh, the coming along and the technology. Richard, I'm, just there. I'm not sure whether it's me, but your your audio has gone uh, rather distorted my end at least is is it okay with everyone else before we before we carry on yeah. no, i was saying distorted for me as well 
Yeah. Okay, uh, Richard, if you don't mind, I'll pass over to I'll pass over to Ron quickly and see if he's got anything further to, to add on that one. Um, the only thing I would say is that um, one of the uh, I, I could easily get a, um, accused of just being um, being old and old fashioned on something like this, um, but. Um, I I agree that um, that the amount of electronic um, equipment on board ship and the uh, generation of data that comes from that equipment um, is is has, you know is, is an issue and uh, I've investigated um, a number of um, a number of cases in recent times where it's been quite clear that um, the amount of data that's being generated by the um, by the equipment is um, is creating issues for those on board in terms of processing that data and uh, and I think one of the things that I've noticed increasingly on uh, in recent investigations is the um, misuse or lack of um, appreciation of ECDIS and uh, and it's perhaps a um, a topic for conversation at a um, at another time but. I'd be, you know, interested in Duncan's view on, on on this. Is that one of the things that we find uh, when investigating groundings and uh, and the like with uh, involve and uh, a misuse of ECDIS is actually the difficulties in downloading the data from an ECDIS, which always seems to be um, which which always seems to be a huge problem for us. Um, it only seems to be available. Downloading data from ECDIS mm -hmm. only ever seems to be available uh, to the manufacturer themselves. I don't. I'm, Sorry, I don't mean to take over from you, Joss, but I just thought I'd direct that question towards uh, towards Duncan. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's definitely one of the things we've found as well. So in Ectus, you're, you're typically going to be able to get uh, uh, positions every four hours uh, from a, say, in an Excel uh, kind of format, as well as you should get one minute positions and speeds and courses uh, for the last 12 hours. Uh, but a lot of them also have uh, a replay that you can. So when you're on board, you can go, you can look, and you can replay the the actual the actual track, and you can see where where the operator was clicking and what charts they're using, things like that. Uh, the issue with that is it's all proprietary recordings that it is. Uh, so it's not recording the the actual data that's used to make up the, the what you see on the on the screen. All it is recording is essentially a recording of the of the screen, and that's always in the manufacturer's format. So you've got then got to have either to go to the manufacturer and they can play it on one of their systems and send you a video back, or uh, we've done in the past because in Singapore we've got Transas Ectus in the office. Uh, so with Transas files, we can then play them back and and, and take the data off them manually uh, a lot of the time to. To give a, a table that can be used for further analysis, but it's definitely definitely one of the issues with Ectus. Is. Duncan, thank you for that. I mean, uh, I'm sure that the audience understood 100 percent of what you were saying there, but I must admit, for uh, little old me, uh, you lost me so, sort of. But you know, thank you for that analysis, and as I say, I'm sure it was very useful to to the audience. Um, just just to go back into the questions here and i think this is particularly pertinent with the in the context of, of imo 2021 uh, on the horizon and, and cyber security being on the minds of, of many in the market uh and and apologies for my pronunciation here uh but we've got uh, a seagull senos here who's saying uh what if the data is manipulated and and how can courts make sure that data is reliable uh, and how courts approach data sources if uh, AIS is turned off just before or after the collision. Um, Richard, it might be best to go to you first for, for this question. Richard, it might be best if we go to go to someone else for that question. Uh, <laughs> Tim, uh, how about you to, to start off with us there? Yeah, I think there's, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, it's it's a it's essentially about the non-availability of, of data and whether or not that might be deliberate non-availability. Um, 
which which obviously can probably result well i suspect that can result in inferences in either direction um if, if the data is suspiciously unavailable you then have a sort of another angle which is that, that as we've discussed you have blind spots or problems with the refresh rate so that you know at, at the crucial time the ais wasn't uh, refreshing so we missed the collision if you like or alternatively the the vdr uh, data wasn't available uh, for whatever reason, whether it was a technical fault um, or something else. And that's the availability of data. And then there is also then the issue of whether that data could be um, manipulated or corrupted, if you like, once within the hands of an opponent, um, and whether or not that data, if you possess it, and it's highly valuable in a particularly high value case, whether or not that data is, 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 you know, vulnerable to malicious actors when it's in your possession. Uh, and I suppose all of this comes to integrity of the sort of the, the data supply chain and, and preserving that and, and cybersecurity is highly relevant to that, I think. Um, but it's quite a broad, quite a broad question, but those are my thoughts on it. Back to you, Joss. Thanks for that. Uh, Duncan, do you, want to, do you want to come in there given your sort of technical expertise on the, on the subject? Yeah, and it's, it's one thing that we are obviously very conscious about is uh, if anything does get to the stage where you're in court, it's important that you're able to to show where how you've, uh, say, you've, you've produced a plot. It's important to show every step of the plot back to the original data and, and have that clarity uh, from our side. And, and that clarity means the, the, op the opposite side can look at it uh, and agree with it or disagree with it where we can. And, and it comes round to, to having essentially agreed plots and agreed uh, agreed animations. Uh, I think that's that's important. And, that, and there's, there is always two, at least two sides looking at the presumably the same data. Uh, data coming off the vessel is uh, difficult and you uh, there is opportunities for it to to be edited and things like that, but we can look uh, in at the data and see if there's various telltale signs that can we can show you if a data has has been manipulated uh, a little bit. Uh, but it, it, it would be quite difficult to say if you wanted to say change the the GPS positions that were contained in the data, you'd have to change the the raw the raw the raw messages from the the GPS that have been recorded by the VDR. You then have to look at the radar images, maybe Ectus images that you have to change the positions. So it was a, it's a big job to do it. Uh, I don't think it's as common as as anyone anyone would we would would, ima would imagine really. And, and and Duncan, just just to stay with stay with you uh, quickly here, and others may want to to comment on this as well. You know, um, it. it it feels to me that we're creating a picture where at least the the use of of some data in a casualty re reconstruction is fast becoming the norm. But uh, you know, in terms of the cases that Solis uh, are are asked to act on, uh, how many instances do you find that there simply isn't enough data, or the data isn't be good enough to to effectively be deployed? Yeah, it's it's a challenging one, but it's, it's more with AIS data. Uh, so AIS data relies on their being essentially two things the vessel needs to be transmitting at the time uh, and it needs to be within uh, within VHF range of a receiving station. There is uh, obviously uh, satellite AIS data or satellites picking up AIS data but the, the refresh rate's not great and because the satellites are covering such a large area they find it very difficult to be able to interpret all the AIS signals uh, getting the time, so we do we do see it uh, often. It's it's getting better, definitely. Uh, the the coverage of AIS is, is getting better, and then as well with with VDR, the older VDRs are still twelve hours recording, so someone's still got to press the save button, which is not happening every time. Uh, thank, thanks for that, Duncan. I've just um, I've just actually noticed I've done a very good poor job of sharing as we're five minutes over time right now. Um, you know, I, I don't think we've been able to answer all of the questions in the, in the boxes, but we'll certainly get to answering some of those via email in in slightly slower time. Um, 
you know, I think I think just to, just some closing thoughts, and I don't know whether anyone's got to add on this. I mean, you know, it's been it's been a fascinating presentation, and I think it's 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 great it's great that we're seeing you know the acceleration of technology within the industry, uh, and and also I will add that it's, it's good to see UK and London based firms sort of leading the way in terms of in terms of the use of that technology and the way in which the law firms and the clubs are are deploying it. Uh, but also uh, equally as heartening, you know, I, I don't feel like we are heading to a, a dystopian future. Uh, and of course, markets like Hong Kong and London that pride themselves on their expertise uh, and their knowledge, you know, that, that knowledge and that expertise is still absolutely crucial uh, when it comes to uh, not only interpreting data, but taking uh, various other sources when assessing uh, the causation uh, of a casualty. And, you know, I think that's a I think that's a, a, a positive note to to be ending on. Uh, I'll, I'll pass over to the floor to see if there are any other sort of closing thoughts. Uh, and and Tim, maybe I'll I'll, I'll start with you there. Uh, thanks, Joss. Yeah, not not a huge amount to add to that. I think we're still doing what we similar to what we did many years ago, but there is a greater focus on data. But it isn't the sort of the holy grail and solving all the problems of the world. It's it's creating problems in some senses, but uh, it, it's taking us in a positive direction, and that's uh, that's how I would see it. Uh, back to you, Joss. Ron, uh, how about you? I mean, do you um, do you sway anywhere from from that sort of summing up? I think you summed it up uh, perfectly, uh, Joss. Um, really, not much to add to that um, at all. Um, I suppose just as a um, one uh, final comment is that, um, from my experience, um, talking about uh, voyage data recorders, <clears throat> is just just the uh, the sheer amount of voyage data recorders that are out there, and the um, and the uh, the different levels of uh, uh, information and data that's available from those uh, voyage data recorders. Um, some seem to be um, all singing or dancing. Um, others give um, just very, uh, you know, the simplified BDRs uh, give very little, you know, sort of give very uh, limited information. But um, but we're certainly moving in the right direction, and I endorse uh, uh, everything that you said uh, there, Joss. Perfect. And, and, and Duncan, Richard, I mean, Richard, perhaps we'll, we'll come to you. I see you've, you've rejoined us, hopefully with audio working perfectly this time. So let's uh, let's go on to you quickly. Yeah, I hope that that's working better. I, I think. Uh, so, yeah, I think data will always have its place. Um, and I think probably what we'll be facing with is a huge increase in both data uh, amounts and types of data we're getting in, which will only add to it's going to be sifting out the relevant data just to make sure we get the picture we want to see that gives the, the true picture um, and making sure we, 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 we don't uh, that we get we don't get overwhelmed by the amount of data which might become available in the future uh, but the role of the, the expert and the role of the mariner uh, will, will always be key to it but uh, data will be there is, is a supporting role and that role will only continue to grow and Duncan, any any anything further to add from from what Richard said there? No, I think that's that's all pretty much summed up there. Uh, I think just with Ron's, Ron's point as well, VDRs is something that is the the challenge for us looking at VDRs is just the range of formats of data that we look at is uh, can be challenging at times. Well, I think that all that uh, leads me to do is to say uh, thank you so much to all of our presenters here today. I think you did a fantastic job on what is. Uh, an intriguing field and i think i think maybe you know in some ways there are there are other areas which we could which we could go off here and explore uh, explore further maybe maybe uh, in the near future um just just one further note to say that the solid presentation will be sent also sent round to uh, all of those people who who joined the call today uh, i'd like to i'd like to thank you all and and wish you a, a very good rest of the day uh, thanks again for your time today, uh, and that's that's all from us. So uh, goodbye. Thanks. Goodbye. <clears throat>